with for the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit be you alone are my heart's desire From Washington, D.C., we present to you our second speaker. He is known for motivating and inspiring young youth from across the world. His strength in incorporating theology into his motivational speeches leaves his audience very moved. And he is here today to motivate us, the CMYC Youth of 2017. Now let's welcome Brian Greenfield. It, 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 it's funny when, um, when they say that like I'm a motivational speaker because I don't see that because I think in the, the grand scheme of things, what I say up here right now is very small because everything that happens throughout this talk or the hour that I'm up here with you is basically going to be up to you guys to see what God can do in your life. So I'm the smallest part of this whole equation. But I have a question for you. And... I'm going to try to go slow, you know, because I don't want things to get lost in translation, but sometimes I have the tendency to get excited and I'll go a little bit faster. And if I do go too fast, just raise your hand and I'll try to do something different. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But here's a question just to see where you're at. If God has done something good in your life, let me hear you say amen. 
Okay, that's a little bit better. It, 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 let me, let's, let's try that uh, again one more time. If God has done something good in your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. Oh, very good. That's, if God has done one good thing in your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. Okay, if God has done two good things in your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. What's, what's your name? Manuel, man, how do you, Manuel, stand up, man. Well, everyone clap it up for her real quick. Give me two good things that God has done in your life. Well, um, life. life. And, happiness. and happiness. Clap it up for her. Clap it up for her. If God has done three good things in your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. What's your name? Mark. Mark, stand up, Mark. Everyone clap it up for Mark. Mark, give us three good things that God has done in your life. Family. Family. Friends. Friends. Education. Education. Clap it up for Mark. If God has done four good things, let me hear you say amen. amen. If God has done five good things, let me hear you say amen. amen. Six. Amen. Now everyone's like, ah. Uh, everyone's like, I, I, I should say amen, but I don't want him to call on me. Uh, oh. You know, it's important for us to remember the good things that God has done in your life. I've been praying for you guys, and, I, and I'll be honest, this is probably one of the most memorable uh, conference retreat experiences that I will ever have. When I go back to Florida, because that's when I flew in from, I will remember this retreat experience. When I got in, Mary picked me up from the airport, and I was asking her, what's, what's kind of going on right now? What's like the vibe of of everyone at the conference. And she said that uh, you're doing like a meet and greet right now. This is at 11.30 at night. And I'm like, okay, what type of meet and greet goes on at 11.30 at night? So I was thinking I would get to the hotel and you know, people be walking around, maybe drinking some soda, drinking some water, and, and it'd be kind of dying down. So we drive up and I hear the music playing. And I'm like, there must be like a wedding or, or something else going on here. I don't know. Because this can't be a retreat that's going on right now. And then I walk inside and it's weird because we're going straight to where the music's going on. And I walk and I look in the mirror and I see, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do the dance, but I see people like this and shaking. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then so I, I come in and my man right here, he runs around the table who never met. And he hugs me like I'm a long lost brother. And I'm like, we do that in the church? We can do that? And then I hear the music and I go inside of the, the, the meeting room. And around this time, it's like midnight. And I go inside and I, I expect it to be bare. No one there. And I go inside and everyone in this place is jumping in the air. You're jumping in the air and you're holding arms and you're doing some dance that I've never seen before, but all of you know how to do. And I'm like, what is going on? I was like, this is the wildest group of people that I've ever been around. And it was midnight and it didn't look like you were going to slow down. It looked like someone was going to have to stop you to get you to stop. And then I was like, okay, it's, it's, it's got to die down. It's going to die down eventually. And then the next day, 6 a.m., everyone's up again. And, and the chant of, we don't rest. I, kept, I started hearing that, we don't rest. We don't rest. And then I look at the schedule and it said, last night you were up till 2 a.m. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, these people party at a whole nother level. I thought when I was younger, I knew how to party, but these people go at it. But... I think that that is beautiful. I think that that's amazing. And I think that the church needs that. The church needs that passion. The church needs that, that, that familial spirit. The church needs that willingness to give of yourself. Because we don't see a lot of that in the church right now. And we don't see a lot of that in the world that we live in. The church is calling you. When I travel around, people ask me, Brian, what do you think that God is doing um, in, in the world right now? And there's kind of two answers. One, I understand that the enemy, the devil, is breaking things apart. Unapologetically. You look at your lives, you look at the news, you look at, you know, things that are going on in your cities, and you can see the negativity. 
unapologetic, and it's everywhere, and nobody goes untouched. But what the Bible says is this, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So what have I been seeing? I've been seeing God just pick people. It's like God's forming a militia right now. He's just picking people. And it isn't always the perfect people, right? It isn't always the most learned people. It's people that have a heart. It's people that have courage inside of them. It's people that can see the negativity that's going on around them and aren't going to run the opposite way. It's people that will meet this culture of death with life. It's people that can see the hopelessness and say, I'm not going to run away, but I'm going to put hope in this situation. So when I see you guys and the passion that you have and the no rest, we're not going to rest and that, that desire to, to not sleep, even though I, at some time you got to go to sleep. When I see that spirit inside of you, I know that the world needs you. So I was praying, what, God, what do you want me to say to them? Because there's so many messages that was, it was like kind of swirling in my head. And I'd never want to go to a situation with a can-fix attitude. That's why it was amazing just to see you yesterday at Niagara Falls, just to see you at breakfast and just listen to your conversation and observe you on the bus because I want to know what you're dealing with and I want to know what the Lord is trying to tell me to tell you. And from the talks yesterday and even from the spirit that you had on Friday, the Lord gave me this, set free to set free. God wants to set you free, to set other people free. That's why you're here. Because if you leave this place and you're still struggling with the same thing that you came in here with, then this weekend meant nothing. If you leave this place and you're not a little bit holier, you're not a little bit more loving, you're not a little bit more passionate about God, then when you go back to your regular lives, what are they going to say about the God that you serve? They say this, that if you have a, a non-believer and a believer, standing next to each other, and they look exactly alike. They talk the same, they act the same, they believe the same, and they love the same, then one of them is lying. Either the non-believer secretly believes, or the believer really doesn't believe. And that's the question that you got to ask yourself. What are we going to do when you leave this? And I always say, when I do these like retreats, that there's an 80-20 rule that goes on. 80% of you get it. 80% of you have lived life enough where you can see the negativity and what I'm saying rings kind of true. You know that there's a change that needs to happen. 20% can care less. 20% are like, okay, where's the next party? You know, this, this guy's cute or this girl, when, how am I going to get this girl's number? That's 20%. I don't believe it's true right now. And I tell you this, it can't be true with us. You got to do something. You got to do something for the people in your life. You got gifts and people need to see those gifts beyond the external, the internal. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I, you know, I wasn't, you know, some people are like, are like Brian, where are, are you a convert or, you know, I wasn't, I didn't come out the womb with a Bible spitting scriptures, you know, saying, John, you know, I didn't come out, I wasn't born like this. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I was something you call a, um, a CEO Catholic. CEO means Christmas and Easter only. That's kind of when I would go to church, Christmas and Easter only, unless the church was too packed. If it was too packed, then we would go to the pancake house and forget everything, and I'd just eat some pancakes and have another sort of spiritual experience with my pancakes and, you know, the strawberry syrup. That's what it was. So I grew up like, like church was there, but it wasn't really a focal point in my life. When I was younger, I went through the things that everyone else goes through. There was a little bit of bullying. There was a little bit of struggles. My family wasn't perfect. My, you know, my, my parents weren't married. So there were those things that I dealt with just as, as a kid. I got into high school, and you would think that high school would make things better, but you all know the difference. When you get older, it gets a little bit more difficult. So I went to high school, this big black dude. I went to high school, and I'm this big black dude in, in, in my high school, and I want to have this persona. I wanted to be like, you know, this strong, tough. Like, you know, like the rappers, like tough thug guy, you know, I, I walk around the school and I was this tough guy. And some people look at me and they're like, he's tough. 
is from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the most dangerous city ever. I'm like, no, not really. I am not a tough guy. I can take my glasses off and I can squint my eyes and I may look tough, but I am not a tough guy. But I thought, okay, that's how I was supposed to act. So I went to my all guys private school and I wanted to be the toughest guy in my all guys private school. I went to all guys private school and I'll tell you this right now, there are no tough guys at an all guys private school. Like we act tough, but not really any real tough guys there. So I would walk around my school and I, did, I didn't know what it meant to be really tough, but I knew the music that I listened to. And I tried to listen to like the most hardcore rap albums I could hear and they would tell me how to be tough, how I was supposed to act. They said, Brian, you gotta wear a hoodie. All right, I'll wear a hoodie. Brian, you gotta dress in all black. Okay, I wear all black. Brian, you gotta put the headphones on your ears and you can never smile. So I'd be like, okay. I wear headphones and I walk up and down the hallways of my all guys private school with my sweatshirt on, with my hoodie up, with my earphones on, not smiling, trying to be tough. I wasn't tough, but I was trying to be tough. Trying to be something that I wasn't. Again, God was there, you know, people kept trying to preach to me, kept trying to teach me, kept trying to tell me what, what my life was about, but that wasn't part of what I desired in my heart. I was more so focused on my ego and getting other people to approve of me as opposed to getting God to approve of me. So I was going through high school like that, trying to be some big tough guy, which I really wasn't. And we all know this, when you try to be something that you're not, you don't get fulfilled. You just get lost. If you're with me, let me hear you say amen. You, you guys in the back, if you're with me, let me hear you say amen. Okay, I just want to make sure I haven't lost any. All right. Okay, this seems stronger. So, you know, that's why I was, I was in high school acting like this for so long. And I go to college with the same mentality. Again, God was present. I was trying to do something in my life. I was willing to listen to God. I go to college with the same persona that I'm going to go and I'm going to be the quote unquote man. I'm going to be the guy that all the women are going to love and all the guys are going to love to hang around. So I go to college. I remember I the college party running with my little tough guy thing and we used to have this dance back in the day that I used to embrace, it would show how tough you are. It was like, it was called slam dancing and some of you may have never heard of that before, but that's what we used to do. It was to kind of prove how tough we were. All right, uh, she says and that that be a, a liability because ba I'll explain it. Basically, what we did was this: a song would come on, and me and my friends would hear the song, and we would like look at each other because we knew it was time to slam. And no one, we didn't coordinate it. We just knew that this was the time. So what we would do? We would look at each other, and it was basic. All you did was run full speed into each other. That's it. So I would look at my friend, and he would look at me, and I would start bouncing, and then he would start bouncing and then I would sprint towards him and he would sprint towards me and we'd slam at each other in the middle of the party and then we'd bounce backwards and then we'd do it over again just, just to prove how, how tough we were. But right while that was happening, you know, sometimes we believe that when we're in the midst of our struggles that God isn't moving, but while that was happening, God was slowly pulling me in. God was slowly making me question the way that I was living my life. God started putting people in my life. He put this one wild Italian guy in my life that made me really question the life that I was living. He invited me on this retreat, similar to the one we're going through right now. He invited me on this retreat. Now, I had grown up in a Catholic family. We didn't go to mass. I went to Catholic schools, but I had never, I had never experienced a retreat like this, a retreat where it wasn't about the show. 
It was about giving your heart. A retreat where I could hear God's voice calling out to me to be who I really was, not the mask that I had put on. So I go on this retreat and everything is fine. My job on this retreat was to pray for some people. So I was supposed to pray for five people. And I remember praying for them really hard and, you know, hoping that something would happen to them because in my mind, I was perfect. God, there's nothing more that God could do for me. And there's this one night, this Saturday night on this retreat where we had Eucharistic adoration. You know Eucharistic adoration? We were praying, we were praying inside the chapel. We were praying in this church and my friend was jumping around. My friend kept saying that this is your moment. This is your moment. God wants to do something in your life. It's time to let go. It's time to let go and be who God created you to be. He kept saying, this was your moment. In my mind, I thought that I was perfect. I thought that I didn't need anything. I had no idea the person that I was hiding behind the facade. So I'm listening to my friends say this, and I'm listening to them running around. I'm listening to the music playing, but I have no idea what God has in store for me because I didn't think that I could get any more from God. My friend says, this is your moment. So I remember praying. And I remember looking around at the people around me. I looked out of this corner of my eye and I saw this one young lady. And, and it looked like she was getting like emotional about everything that was going on in the retreat. And I kind of ignored that because, you know, that wasn't kind of my, my thing. And then I looked out of the corner of my other eye and I saw another young lady get emotional. I was like, oh, okay, if you want to get emotional, go ahead. I'm a tough guy from DC and I slam dance. So I'm not gonna do that. My friend kept saying that God wanted to give me something more, something that I'd never experienced before. My friend said God wanted to give me a new heart. And I was like, what are you talking about? I looked at the girl on the side again and I noticed that she was crying. I was like, what? What's going on? <laughs> what's, what's going on here? Why? And I was like, okay, I have a I have a sister, my mom and my sister, okay, your life must be, go ahead. Then I looked out the corner of my eye again, I saw another young lady, she begins to cry. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? Again, I, I was like, okay, I have a, I have a, uh, a mother, I have a sister, and they cry sometimes, so go ahead and cry. Then the weird thing to happen. I looked straight in front of me and I saw a guy. And I saw him like rubbing his face. I saw him sniffing. I saw him begin to look down and my ego was like, no way. He's not gonna do that, is he? Cause I knew kind of what was coming. I saw him rubbing his face and I saw him like, like swallowing kind of heavy. I turned away for a second. Appreciate it. I turned away for a second, and when I turned back, this guy started to, he was crying. I was like, there is no way I'm going to be that guy right there. I don't care what's happening, there is no way. If this is what Jesus is going to give me, if Jesus is going to make me cry, then I don't want any part of that. I don't want to think about the bad things in my life. I don't want to think about the struggles. I don't want to be this crying person. Remember, I'm a tough guy. I'm 19 years old. When, when I grow up when past 18, you don't do that. So this guy's crying. I had no idea what's going on, so I just tried to ignore it. My heart, my, my ego is like, Brian, bite your lip and you'll get through this time. Five minutes pass, another person starts crying. Ten minutes pass, more people start crying. The music's playing. My friend is telling me, this is your moment. Jesus wants to do something in your heart. This is what you've been looking for. You've been hiding all your life. You've been sucking up everything, trying to be strong for everybody, but you don't have to be. This is your moment. All, after a half hour, the whole church was crying. I was the only one sitting back in my pride like, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, I don't, I don't need any of this. I was biting my lip trying to get through it, but you all know what happens when tears want to come out and you don't want to let them come out. So I started thinking about everything that was happening around here. You know, some of you can come here and you see people that are, that are inspired by the Lord. 
You see people whose lives have changed through an encounter with God and there's this question that goes on in your mind. How come their life looks like this and my life looks like this? How come when they pray it looks different from the way that I pray? When I was looking at all these people, those were the things that was going on in my life. What's going on here? Because if God is resonating with these people in this way, I know in my life that I'm not perfect. I know in my life that there's things that, I, there's questions that I can't answer. I started thinking about my life and my situation, where I was going, the things that I had gone through, the things that I had ignored. And then you begin to feel that lump in your eye. Well, I began to feel that lump in my throat. I started thinking about my mom and the way that I was to her. I started thinking about the people that I ignored. I started thinking about the things that people had said to me about who I was supposed to be. I started thinking about those people that I would be around and they would begin to laugh. And they weren't laughing with me, they were laughing at me. And then I began to feel that lump get a little bit heavier. My pride was like, this is not your moment. My pride was like, this is not for you. My pride was like, you are exactly who I said you were. You are the sum of every mistake that you've made. You are the sum of every bad act that happened to you. What they said about you back home, that's exactly who you are. My heart was saying something different. My heart was saying that there's something more out there. My heart was saying that you're loved. But my pride was saying, Brian, that's for the rest of these holy people. That's not who you are. My heart said, Brian, you need to give in right now so you can see who you were created to be. My ego is like, bring it on. So I remember I started thinking about my life and I gave God this one, this one moment. I said, God, if you're real, I'll give you everything that I got. God, if you're real, I'll give you everything that I got. Because I promise you this, God, if I leave this church with all these crying, praying people, I'm never coming back. God, if you're real, I'll give you everything. And then something welled up inside of me and I, it was like a scream inside of me. God, if you're real, I'll give you everything. And then the tears came and it was like nasty and it was, you know, but for the first time in a long time, I felt free. You know, I come from DC, I'm in Florida right now, we're in, we're in Toronto right now, but I know this, that all of us have a longing on our heart. Okay, I work at an all guys school, and um, I can tell the people that are struggling and trying frantically not to let that stuff out. And sometimes we believe that the tough external that's going to get us through life. The tough external, that's how we fight the evils in this world. But that's never been the case. Jesus saved all of us. How? By giving his heart. I was reading the scriptures. If you're, with, if you're still with me, let me hear you say amen. I was reading the Bible and um, I was keying in on John chapter 11. It's the story of the, um, oh, the story of La the resurrection of Lazarus. Understand this, in that, there's our story. And it goes like this, and I know that you can relate to this. Jesus is preaching, and he says that Lazarus has died. You can imagine this, Martha and Mary, La their brother Lazarus is sick. So they go sin for Jesus. Because there's a hope inside of Martha and Mary that if Jesus comes, then everything is going to be okay. So they sin for Martha and Mary. I mean, Martha and Mary sin for Jesus. The guy gets to Jesus and says, your friend Lazarus is sick, you need to come. It's that Jesus waits two days before he even starts his journey to Lazarus. And we use our imagination. We've all been in 
just by a show of hands, how many of you have been in a, in, a, in a tough situation where you needed God to show up in your life? Just raise your hand real quick. We've all been there where we needed God to do something. Lads, Martha and Mary, they were struggling. And you can imagine this. The first day G Jesus doesn't show up. But Martha and Mary, they still have that hope inside of them. Because you know this, when we pray for certain things, I remember when I was younger, uh, I had a grandparent and they were sick and I was praying to Jesus. I was like, Lord, just don't take my grandmother. Do something to make her better. Or there were times when I was a little bit older and I had bills that could not be paid and I would pray to God, God, I don't have the money for this bill. I need you to do something to help me out because I have a wife and I have two kids and I need you to do something because I don't have what they're telling me that I need. And you pray to God in those situations. And maybe God doesn't move the first day, but there's still hope inside of you. With Martha and Mary, there was still hope inside. Jesus didn't come the second day, but you can still see that there's some sort of hope inside of them. Lazarus dies and Jesus still isn't there. But there's a hope that maybe, maybe God can still do something. If Jesus comes, then, then maybe there's hope for my brother. Maybe there's still hope for my situation. Jesus finally comes four days later after Lazarus is in the tomb. Martha and Mary, you can see that the hope has left them. There's a faint level of hope inside of them. That maybe something can happen. Martha and Mary. Jesus says this to Jesus. If you had been there, then my brother would still be alive. Where were you? That's something that all of us have gone through. Where something happens, and we ask God, where were you when, when this was going on? Where were you when I was struggling? Where were you when I was hurting? Where were you when life didn't make sense? The young lady that I spoke to us yesterday, she spoke about those where were you when moments when she was being tortured. Where were you when those things happened to me? We've all been there. The reality is some of us are right there right now. Where were you? Where are you now? And what happens is when we go through those where were you when moments where God doesn't answer our prayers, a lot of us, like Lazarus did, a lot of us go into the tomb and we shut God out. Because God hasn't done things on our timetable when we wanted God to do those things. And then we go in the tomb. Martha, Mary, and Lazarus in that moment, they were all in the tomb because Martha and Mary had lost hope. Where were you when? In your own life right now, think about that. Where were you, where, what is your where were you then moment? Jesus goes to Martha. And then Jesus goes to Mary and receives the same sort of greeting. Where were you? My brother would be here if you were here. And sometimes as believers, some of us who are strong in our faith, when God doesn't act, when we want God to act, it can be even more frustrating than a non-believer. Because someone who doesn't believe in God, they don't expect God to do anything. But we know that God can do amazing things. We read the stories. We know the gospel verses. We know that God created the world in seven days and that God can move mountains. But then we ask ourselves the questions when we're struggling, God, where are you? You can do something. You can change my life. Where are you? So Mary and Martha are there crying, struggling, hurting, wondering if God can do something in their situation. And we sit there too. Because we have the questions, can God do something in my situation? Martha and Mary, they were in the tomb like Lazarus was. And truth be told, sometimes we go in the tomb. And we walk around our neighborhoods, we hang out with our friends, and we smile. And we act like everything's okay. When in reality, behind that tomb, there's a hurting person. Jesus says this. And this is how Jesus moves in our life. He says to Martha and Mary, take me to the tomb. They take Jesus to the tomb. 
and we see all of these people looking at what's going on with Jesus. Martha and Mary, they're looking because inside of them, again, when you listen to this story, put yourself there. Martha and Mary, they look at Jesus. They look at him approaching a situation that looks done. But there's a little bit of hope that Jesus can do something in this dark situation. The other people around, they're looking also. They're looking down at this situation, Jesus walking to the tomb wondering, is this Jesus who they say that he is? Jesus goes to the tomb and he says this, remove the stone. They remove the stone. Then Jesus goes a step forward. You have everybody looking at this going on, hoping, wondering, is this the Messiah that they say that he is? They, move, they remove the tomb. They remove the rock from the tomb. And Jesus says to Lazarus, come out. Well, I'm going to do, do something with you all real quick. Can you hit that first song for me? Stay with me, stay with me. Close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes. Now follow along with me. Grand Earth Let's turn it down a little bit. Before. Turn it down a little bit. Move by the sound of now we talked a second ago about those where were you when moments. In your life right now, Can we in everything that you've been through, what is that moment where you're like, Jesus, where were you? Where you said to Jesus, where were you when? And through it all, through it what is, all where is that situation? Where you were walking and around and everyone else thought that it was perfect, it but you understood what was going on beneath the surface. And it is well with me. Where is that moment where you were like, Jesus, where were you when? Where in your life was the time when you went inside the tomb? Even when you know, there was a time when you really believed in God. But then something happened that rattled you. I don't know what it's like here, but when I talk to my guys when I'm in Florida, a lot of it happens in families. There's a death in a family. And they trusted in God. And through it all. But God didn't come through the way that they wanted God to come through. And they went into that tomb. God, where were you? There was a divorce that happened in the family. And they wanted God to make their parents love one another again. They wanted God to make their families whole again. But God didn't move. So they were trapped in that tomb and they didn't want to come out. Something got broken in the midst of a relationship. And it may not have been their foot, it may not have been your foot at all, but something happened. And then you found yourself trapped in a tomb. Where is that? Where were you when? Because if you grasp that, you understand what Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were going through. Looking at Lazarus. Like Jesus is right now in this moment looking at each and every one of you in this church right here. Like Jesus was in that moment 20 years ago looking at me in that church in New Jersey. He's looking at each and every one of you in your own individual tombs. Like he was looking at Lazarus. Everyone look up. Everyone look up. And Jesus says, now this is something, you know, in the church we try to make everything super spiritual and we try to 
make everything about ego, but it's not about that. But this is a question that all of us have to wrestle with. Let me ask you this. Every perfect person in this room, everyone in this room that struggles with nothing, raise your hand right now. If you struggle with nothing, if your life is perfect, raise your hand. Outside of you three, the rest of you stay with me. about free people said other people free and through it all, but I don't know what enslaved people do all, my I don't know what scared people do and through it all, I don't know what people in bondage do because well. I don't know how to get freedom from someone who isn't free themselves all, I don't know how to experience love from someone who has no idea that they're loved and it is well. But God is right there with you, with each and every one of us. He's been with you on Friday and he's here with you now. He's saying this, come out the tomb. But like Lazarus, if you're with me to me, he say amen. amen. But like Lazarus, we got to make the decision to come out. We got to make the decision to come out. And sometimes it's not a matter of something super crazy happening. Sometimes it's just about, I'm tired of being here. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of crying. I'm, I'm tired of holding it all back. I'm tired of believing that I'm nothing or that I'm less. I'm tired of my voices from the past determining my present and determining my future. It's about people saying this, I look at the way that the world is for you. I look at the way that my country is and I'm tired of it. And I see enough people in the tomb. I see enough people living out of fear and living out of slavery. I choose not to. I choose not to. Today I choose to be free. Today I choose to believe that I'm loved and that I'm not alone. And even if no one else in this church chooses it with me, I'll go at it alone because I hear the voice of God calling. Lazarus makes the decision. Stay with me. Eyes on me. Stay with me. Lazarus makes Lazarus makes the decision to come out of that tomb. He comes out. And what happens? Jesus is standing there with you. If this is your challenge right now. And I'll take this for a landing right now. Jesus says this to the people. He doesn't take his Lazarus' bandages off. Jesus goes to the people. And he says to the people, unbind this man. Unbind this man. 
He has the people help set him free. Free people. Free people. That's what you're called to do. Do me a favor, I'm closing with one last prayer. Grab the hand of the person next to you real quick and close it with this. Close your eyes. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to pray for the person on your Close your eyes. I want you to pray for the person on your left. If there's no one on your left, that's okay. Just receive the prayer. Pray for the person on your left. Whatever they're going through, you may not know them, but you may know them really well. Pray for their struggles. Pray for their hurts. If you don't know what their struggle is, at least pray that they don't have to go through what you went through. Pray for the person on your left. After you pray for that person, pray for the person on your right. Pray that they be able to be free. That they will know that they're loved. That they will know that God is with them in their life. Now it's going to get a little tougher. Pray for the last person that hurts you. And that prayer may just be, God, I give it to you. Because I don't want to hold it no more. Pray for the person that hurts you. the last person that you hurt. Pray that God can do something beautiful out of the pain. And lastly, pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Your own situation. Look up real quick. Realize this, the hand that you're holding is not given to you by accident. It's the hand of God in your life telling you this. You came in on Friday and you may have thought you were alone, but you're not alone. You have a God who loves you, who protects you, who keeps you, who sees your heart, not your mistake, who promises you a future full of hope, and who loves you as you are, but refuses to let you stay that way. Amen. So may we each know God's up today, tomorrow, forever. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.